Okay, here we go. Good evening and welcome to Gardening Green Expo 2021. The sponsors of the expo are WaterSmart South Shore, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, Kennedy's Country Gardens, Wild Ones South Shore Mass Chapter, and Edible South Shore and South Coast. Now I'd like to give you a real quick Zoom lesson here. Uh, if you scroll your mouse down, a toolbar will appear at the bottom and there's something called chat. And if you open that up, I'm gonna put links in there that you might need for resources and other things. And then there's another thing called Q&A. So if you have any questions during the presentation, just type them in there. And then when we get to the end, we'll go over those questions. So now I would like to introduce Susan Lee Anthony. Well, hello everybody. Um, thanks for taking the time out tonight to join us for um, what I hope will be um, an educational and, and at least partially um, interesting um, uh, talk. Um, I've worked pretty hard on this. I've learned a lot. I, I already knew a bit about um, native plants and, and um, the invasives, but um, you know, I wanted to do a really good job, so I really did a lot of work on this. Um, and it started when I started to notice uh, how bad um, how bad the um, invasive plants were getting, you know, as I drove around town. And I've lived here since I was three, 1957. So um, it really spurred me. I wrote an article um, for the Herb Society um, group that I'm in, and I kind of been working off of that. Um, so I'm just going to read you just a little quick, um, not that quick, but article about that. And then um, it will segue into um, slides. Um, so back in the 80s, I started work for the Citric Garden Club on their wildflower project. And I continued, I'm sorry, that's the, not the beginning. Oops, very sorry. Sorry about that. Loving up already. Okay. One of the things I've been feeling quite passionate about for the last few years, and increasingly so, is how important it is to start earnestly doing something to eradicate invasive plants. I used to see many more native plants in our local area. And as I said, I've lived here mostly in the same town since 1957 here in Situate. And now specific plants that I used to note in certain places are gone. What I've noticed is the alarming rate at which those precious plants have been disappearing and how in their place, we now have a frightening overabundance of alien species. Most have come from Asia and Europe. And for whatever reason, they love our climate and soil so very much, they're multiplying at an astounding rate. They're just settling all too nicely, um, like they have a right to be here. So these plants push out and overtake our native species and the problem gets worse almost by the minute. I have to wonder at the germination rate of such plants as common reed, the Phragmites australis, the garlic mustard, Aliaria petiolata, and the hairy bittercress, cardamine hirsuta. And of course, there's bittersweet, Celastrus orbiculatus. And to me, the absolute worst is Japanese knotweed, Polygonum cuspidatum. So, I used to know of a patch of white turtle head close to the railroad crossing not far from where I now live, and I can't find it these days. And there was a native fringe tree on the corner of a main road in town. It's not there anymore. And at the top of the hill on the same road near where I grew up stood a large orange flowered rhododendron. I was thinking it might have been Bakerii, but I'm not really sure. But there's no sign of it now. Far too much of what I now see growing on the side of the road or in the vacant lots, the few vacant lots that are left in town are mostly the above mentioned invasive plants and it is seriously alarming. When I was a kid, I spent a good deal of time in the woods. Some of us older people remember we used to be out all day and playing. So my cohorts and I played out there, made forts, used our imaginations and took for granted all this space and verdant beauty that surrounded our lives. The lichen and the moss and the lady slippers and the princess pine and the wintergreen. My mother was particularly enamored with plants. And although back then she called them wildflowers, 
it was not unusual for us to be riding in the enormous white Plymouth station wagon when the car would be suddenly lurched off to the side of the road, my mother shrieking with delight, having sighted some sweet violets, ferns, or other prized wildflowers. Out she'd go, trowel in hand, oblivious to the mud enveloping her shoes, and she kept a cardboard box and a trowel just for this purpose. So she'd always be prepared. These wild treasures would be dug up, carted back to the Plymouth, and off we'd go. And, you know, in those days, it was neither illegal nor shameful to do such a thing, which it is now, most definitely. Um, it's not something we do now. If we were just at home, we might be asked to escort her on a woodland walk, during which she would point out various plants, and we would, uh-huh, a lot, and want to go home to eat Fritos and look at Mad Magazine. Those of you in my age group will know exactly what I'm talking about. But after all that, something must have stuck with me because I developed a serious, into a serious plant lover with a keen appreciation and a strong wish to protect our natives. So I'm just going to start here a little bit on the, um, uh, the slideshow. Just want to show you, here's the pink lip, lady slipper, Cypripedium acale. Um, and the common blue violet. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the lady slipper. Don't try to attempt to grow this. Um, it needs specific mycorrhizum. Um, it requires highly acidic soil, but it tolerates the range of shade and moisture. It really does like some shade and it likes well-drained slopes if you can provide that or if that is, you know, that's where you're gonna see them. Um, found in pine forest. And I thought this was interesting, also in deciduous woods. It was long speculated that a fungus, a fungus um, association was needed for growth and that the C. acale could not be artificially cultivated outside of these associations. However, a greater understanding of orchids in general has shown that this association is only needed to germinate orchid seeds and may not be required once plants begin making true leaves but it's not that well understood. On the right is the viola sororia, um, which is just, you know, the thing that grows in our lawns, but it's an edible flower um, and it's an early pollinator. So, you know, if you can bear to let them be, let them be. Um, it's a great, great little plant. Um, so here we go. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the 1980s for me. Um, uh, you know, I got through the 70s somehow, and so there were the 80s, and I, I had joined the um, Nature Center in Norwell, and I met this man named Bill Perkins, who is no longer with us, and he had the wild weed garden at the Nature Center, and I was intrigued, and he was a very wise, very knowledgeable man um, with, with native plants, and um, he did a lot of walking through the woods. He took me on a swamp walk in Halifax, which is where he lived. And it was magical. I mean, literally like just this dark, um, you know, enchanted space um, with mosses and sphagnum moss and um, another plant um, that I wanna show you. And this is Coptis trifolia or gold thread. Um, it does like moist, um, uh, woodsy areas. And I remember seeing it on tussocks, you know, that were like little islands in the middle of this beautiful swamp. And uh, I know I've seen it at um, Black Pond. Is that the name of it? Black Pond in Norwell? Um, so anyway, um, that was a great experience for me. So back in the 80s, I also started to work for the Citric Garden Club on their wildflower project. And I continued that for 14 years. Um, okay, where am I? Yikes. There's the princess pine. I just wanted to show you that. Don't pick that either. Oh, I don't know what happened here. I think we, um, no, I don't know. Anyway, um, I think it's further down. Um, so at roughly the same time, I was living in Duxbury with a cranberry bog virtually in my backyard and always with an eye for what grew anywhere during my daily walk. 
I came across native plants like blue flag iris, the gold thread, and Rexia virginica. I think I want to show you that next. Here's the Rexia virginica. Um, Rexia virginica likes wet meadows, coastal plain marshes, sandy wetlands, etc. Um, it's also known as meadow pitchers, and it sports an interesting vase-shaped red fruit and stunning fall foliage. And as noted by Henry David Thoreau in his journal on October 2nd, 1856, the scarlet leaves and stem of the Rexia, sometime out of flower, make almost as bright a patch in the meadow now as the flowers did. Its seed vessels are perfect little cream pitchers of graceful form. So, um, I, I, my first, a friend bought me um, my first wildflower book around that time called Peterson's Guide. It was a Peterson's Guide, which I uh, referred to incessantly in those years. And later in the early 90s, when my husband and I were first dating, we did a lot of camping and hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I met many more somewhat rarer native plants on those trails, like Trillium, Twin Flower, and in Mount Washington. Clintonia borealis, which I have a hard time growing down here, but but I got so excited by that twin flower, I'll tell you, <laughs> that I stopped I stopped a car full of people and that were driving by, and I practically insisted or demanded that they get out and look at this plant. I was I was thrilled. I had only seen it in book in books up to that point. But all these were great learning experiences and only increased my appreciation of our native plant species, while also increased, increasing my commitment to educating others about their value in our lives. And I now work part-time as the perennial buyer for an exceptionally great nursery in town called Kennedy's Country Gardens, which affords me the opportunity to bring in native plants and to educate my customers on a regular basis about their virtues and about their proper, ha proper habitats. So, Wanting to save these plants goes far beyond my own nostalgic wish to live in the old days when all these plants um, that I'm going to show you were more abundant. But I believe that, you know, most of us attending in, in here tonight are quite aware of how vital native plant species are to the lives of the native um, bees, you know, insects of all kinds, birds and other wildlife. They serve as food habitat and shelter. And there's a true interdependency of these species that, allow, that happens in nature. And if we fail to protect what is native to our neck of the woods, we face a devastating loss. So in order to do anything about eradicating invasive plants, which I'm gonna start showing you in a minute, I think. Uh, there's the twin flower I wanted to show you that I saw. Um, up in New Hampshire, just adorable little plant. Um, here's some of my going to be my key points. We don't really even new, need to deal with that because I'm going to go over over them. Um, so here's the wildflower garden sign, and um, you know I I have always thought to myself, geez, I hope we're not going to be stuck with this will be the only place that we get to see any native plants, like in a museum setting. So I hope not. And, you know, non-native plant species adapt all too well. We already talked about that. Why is it important? We've talked about that. Um, learning to identify our native plants and the invasive plants is key in addressing the problem. People need to know what these all look like. Um, the vital connection we talked about, we're going to talk about how to deal with invasive invasive plants. And I just snuck this in here because I wanted people to just not use herbicides. It's, it's really not a good idea. Um, uh, there are some people that say there are some plants that can only be dealt with that way. And I just, I won't, I won't buy it. So anyway, um, so the next step is to try to rally your townspeople to become aware of all these, um, issues. And here's a good definition here. A native plant is one that is a part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. 
only plants found in this country before European settlement are considered to be native to the United States. Now, things like Queen Anne's lace and, um, whoops, things like Queen Anne's lace and um, great mullen, um, those are plants that are actually not native to here. We think they are. Chicory's not. Um, uh, what's the other plant? Um, well, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, uh, anyway, um, so there's a lot of plants like that um, that are that are not just because we see them and we've seen them for years does not mean they're actually native. Um, an invasive plant is one that's both non-native and able to establish on many sites, grows quickly, and spreads to the point of disrupting plant communities or ecosystems. And we have a, a number of those that are just out of control. Um, in the case of Japanese knotweed, I just want to, well, I'll get to that. Let's go to the Aliaria. Um, I think it's a good idea, I want to let you know, to, to please um, contact Wild Cohasset um, through Facebook, um, or I think they have a website or they might just be on Facebook. But they, um, even though it's called Wild Cohasset, Situate is involved as well, and they've already planned and people are signing up for a day to deal with this plant. Um, it's um, actually a biennial, I believe, but um, it's not hard to pull up, so that's a good thing. Um, but you wanna get it before the um, flowers go to seed, obviously. Um, on the right is what it looks like before the flower stalk shoots up and on the left I'm sure you've seen this plant um, and it also um, hurts um, it it creates a an area around it there's a name for it I can't think of what it is where um, other plants can't grow so it needs to get out yeah it destroys the fungi that are known to aid in the growth of other plants so pulling is the best method there um, this is hairy bittercress, cardamine, hirsuta. Um, I mean, hairy bittercress, that, that sounds pretty evil. Um, and these, I'm sorry I didn't get better pictures, but I know you know this plant. It's tiny. Um, and it is um, incredibly um, invasive. Um, when those little, in the middle here, when these flowers are done, those little seed capsule things um, are ready to go, they will just fly everywhere. They will see it everywhere. So this is it before it flowers. This is it when it's starting to flower. And this is a close up. Um, just pulling and getting those out. And this is, a lot of these are ones that show up in um, mulch too. So um, it's kind of an issue. I don't know where you're supposed to get mulch these days that doesn't probably have weed seed in it. Um, that's um, just use compost from your own yard. And also when you're, when you're getting rid of these plants, um, when you're pulling them, don't throw them on your compost pile right away. Um, what you need to do is take them, let them um, solarize on the driveway on a tarp and um, become, you know, unable to um, be viable. So bittersweet, we all know what that is. Don't put it on your doors, pretty as it is. There is a native form, but this isn't it. Um, so um, the roots also, when you pull it up, you might see it before it's doing this. And if you can learn to identify it, which I certainly know it now, the roots are bright orange. Um, so that's one way. Um, and um, there is a, an American bittersweet. Um, the flowers and fruit are, are at the axles on Oriental bittersweet and are only terminal panicles on the American bittersweet. Um, the fall fruit capsule color on the Oriental bittersweet is um, orange. Um, so the best way to get this out is pulling, although I know sometimes people run into enormous, huge pieces. I, I don't even know what to tell you to do with that. Um, I wish I had better um, 
um, you know, without resorting to um, herbicides. But um, sometimes if you have a big patch of anything, I do believe in using black plastic. I'm cutting it down as far as you can, covering it with black plastic for, you know, a, a, an entire winter, you know, from the fall into the, um, up until spring. Um, this is the black swallowwort. This is a, this is difficult to pull. It's a tough plant to get out of the ground. It seems to have roots to China. And um, one of the things about this, again, this is a black plastic thing if you've got a lot of it. Otherwise, try to I, be able to identify it because it'll just all of a sudden be in your garden. It's like, oh gosh. Um, so, but one of the things that's really bad about it is that um, when adult monarchs lay eggs on a plant that is similar to milkweed, which this is, um, the toxic toxicity of the black swallowwort is different from the milkweed relative. And tests have shown that 100% of monarch caterpillars hatched on black swallowwort die after eating the swallowwort. So that's, that's really frightening to me. It does get these little black flowers too. Um, here's loose drive. We've all seen it. It's very pretty. It marches up the middle of um, uh, Route 128 like nobody's business. Um, um, but it's an it's a extremely invasive plant. Um, I'm sorry, this slide thing is not working very well. Um, it's, a, it's been introduced a couple of times to North America. Um, it is an herbal remedy from back then, but not so much now. Um, and it's tough because it likes wet areas, so it's tough to get rid of, but whenever you see it, do so. Um, this um, overtakes habitat and outcompetes native aquatic plants, and that'll potentially lower diversity. And it um, provides unsuitable shelter food and nesting habitat for native animals, especially a lot of waterfowl. Um, the dense root systems also change the hydrology of wetlands. So, okay, now we got, here's one that I'm sure you recognize. Um, you'd think it was native. It seems so, so like, you know, it belongs here. I mean, I never knew when I was younger that it wasn't native. Um, and I would cut stalks and stick it in a jug and think, oh, how pretty. And then I found out they were not native and, um, and just horribly invasive. Again, a tough plant, a tough plant to get rid of. But as soon as you see it anywhere starting, get rid of it. Um, when it starts to go down waterways, it's in so much wet, it, it's difficult. Um, so, um, they say burning, flooding extensive for extensive periods of time. And it's been around. It arrived in the late 1700s. So it's been here for a while. Um, Japanese knotweed. This is the one that like sets my teeth on edge. Um, um, it, it's to me the worst. And I've just seen it take off in the last... I don't know, five, 10 years. Um, what I would suggest is to grub hoe it out and cover it with black plastic over the winter. There are some huge patches in town. Down by Oro used to be PJs. Um, along some roads in Marshfield, I've seen tons of it. Um, you know, you kind of can't miss it. Um, at this time of the year, it's just kind of a rusty skeletal thing. But to me, um, here are some pictures. It just grows like it's crazy. Um, this is the flower, although it comes out more than this. I could not find a good flower picture of it. Um, so um, in the UK, this is interesting. Mortgage lenders will often refuse a mortgage to people buying a property with live Japanese knotweed growing on the premises. So I think that's, in, and it says similarly, most buildings Insurance won't cover damage by Japanese knotweed. So I think we should have rules like that. Um, these were just a few that, you know, we often see in our yards. Um, 
but you know they they sneak out and um even in our own yards we we i hear people fighting with these plants in particular um ivy not a good one um uh you know it's I, people still buy it we still carry it because people want it and i'm like Ugh. you know not a good one um, if it grows up your house um and roots onto your house um you'll never get that root um uh coloring off your house um before we reshingled we had that happen the bishop swede um also called ground egg elder um i did fight that in my yard successfully by digging out and covering with black plastic. Um, I was redoing an area, so that was um, a doable thing for me. Um, and uh, yeah, it just goes crazy. Um, Lily of the Valley, um, only plant that in an area that's not gonna be competing with other plants. It's very invasive. Um, you know, I kind of don't wanna be without it because I mean, the scent is incredible, it's lovely, but and then this this baby over here, whoops, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. This guy over here, Glaucoma heteracea, it's also called alehoof. Um, there are other names too. Um, cat's foot, gill over the ground, lawn, um, it was a ground ivy. Um, there's a bunch of um, runaway robin, I like that one. Um, but <clears throat> it, it um, goes by underground runners. I have it in my lawn and I've fought it and um, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, it's got a very distinctive little flower and leaf and a distinctive scent. It is in the mint family, but it's not a mint and it's not something that I find terribly palatable, although they did use it um, in, in um, ale making. Um, so um, that's what the word alewife um, comes from. It's the women used to make the beer found that out. Um, so, okay, so we're going to talk about some native plants now and how we can try to restore uh, these native plants. And, and I want to mention again that the plants that I, for the most part, that I'm going to show you here are ones that I've come across myself, okay, um, that I've known either since I was a little kid or in my years of tromping all over um, the woods and in different areas. Um, so, you know, purchase only true native species, not native ours. You'll go into a place um, and it might say, Menarda Jacob Klein, okay? I'm not saying that's bad. That's bad. I mean, the, the, the pollinators still like these plants, but if what your goal is, is to try to, um, restore the actual native plant, then you don't want a species name. Um, so um, do not dig up plants in the wild. Um, my mother did stop doing that. Um, and you may want to make sure that if you're going to be doing putting any plants and you want to, um, in your own yard, of course, you would easily be able to care for them um, for a while to let them get you know get their um, roots situated but if you're doing it somewhere else um, somewhere out in the woods somewhere um, uh, you know you're gonna need to to give them a little TLC for a while you know so okay here's one of my favorite plants in the whole world I do have one in my yard um, first one I ever saw was actually down at um, Heritage Gardens and museums down in Sandwich. And I was just completely besotted. Um, it's fragrant, it's a very light, lovely fragrance. It's a late spring. Um, it's tolerant to wind and air pollution. Um, it's best grown in well-drained soil and full sun to partial shade. Um, it's really not that picky. Prefers moist, fertile soil, seldom needs pruning. It's also called old man's beard and Grancy Graybeard. Grancy is another word meaning grandpa or granddad. And in the fall, if it's a female, you get these little blue, pretty little navy blue uh, fruits. Um, it is a relative of the olive and the droops, which are those little fruits, can be pickled and eaten. 
Um, so next one. Shadbush, um, Serviceberry, Amelanchier. Um, this is, um, geez, it was doing well earlier. Um, oh boy, yikes, sorry. I don't know, we, we had trouble with this last time. Okay, stay there. Um, this is, um, you've seen these, these are really early bloomers. And before, you know, you're driving around, before anything else um, um, starts to bloom, you'll see these here and there. And we wanna keep seeing them. Um, it um, grows to about 20 feet, uh, blooms in April, loved by native bees, and it's edible to wildlife and to humans. And here are the berries over here. Okay, this is a, that was a whole run of them there. Um, so, which is also pretty. Um, the native columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. I did see that in Hingham, near where my aunt used to live. Um, kind of growing on this rocky hill. And um, when I've seen it growing up in Vermont, it's also kind of on these little slopes and things. Um, we don't need to have, have that situation, but um, that is where I saw it. Um, it's um, just a beautiful plant, the red and yellow. Um, it's a great reseeder if it's happy. And it's beloved by hummingbirds. It's one of the early plants for hummingbirds. And it prefers a little part shade. It blooms in the late spring. Jack in the pulpit, I remember this from being a kid. Um, it um, definitely likes part shade, late spring. Um, here's the spade, the leaves. That's why it's called trifilum, the three leaves. The flower is inside. Um, let it, the berries ripen and you'll have seeds, they'll reseed. Um, I just love this plant when I was a kid. Um, and I and I love the name. I thought it was so cute, um, just so unusual. Um, so it's nice to have a little patch of those. Okay, here's butterfly weed. So especially for those, I mean anybody can grow this, okay? But if you're over near the water somewhere, this is a great plant. Likes kind of sandy soil, um, and um, it's the ultimate monarch butterfly plant. Um, it does go dormant, so you need to, sorry, um, you need to know where you've planted it so you don't plant something else on top of it. Um, so full sun, take a little bit of shade, but not, not so much. And plant the root vertically so the eye is about, um, about two inches beneath the soil surface. Nice bright orange. It's a long blooming time too. Now, this plant, Ceanothus americanus, New Jersey tea, I have never seen growing around here. I put it in because Russ Cohen suggested I do that. It's such a good plant. He feels it's such a good plant. And it is a native. I just not seen it around here. Um, it's named for the fact that it was used as a substitute for tea by the colonists and soldiers during the Revolutionary War, especially when there were tea embargoes. Um, you know, the Boston Tea Party, that and the Menardas, um, you know, bee bombs were used for that. Um, and so the leaves don't contain caffeine. Oh, darn. Come on. Um, on either of those, but um, um, but it fit the bill. It's usually found in sandy soils. So that's another thing. Um, you know, it can be along the side of the road. Um, it can be, um, you know, near, near the beach. Um, but I'm not sure it likes, um, not so sure it likes salt, um, and, um, you know, ocean, but it will take sandy soil. Pretty plant. Um, this is a plant that I, this is the Chiloni glabra, which is the white turtle head. There is a red one too, too. Um, Chiloni Lioni. Um, sounds like um, the name game or something. And this plant um, does look like a little turtle head. It's a late bloomer, late August into September. Um, it's pollinated mostly by bumblebees. 
um, because they have the strength to pry open the bloom and reach the nectar inside. And I thought that was just such a cute little thing. Um, it's also um, a preferred host plant for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. So partial shade on that. Um, sweet fern, um, definitely a big plant from my um, early childhood. Um, uh, down in the Cape, places even in town, um, sandy, side of the road, the whole thing, it'll, it'll take all of that. Um, it's salt tolerant, heat resistant. Um, it's related to bayberry. Um, it's not a fern. It is absolutely not a fern. Um, so called sweet fern because of the foliage shape and the scent. Um, it's a a little bit resiny, um, I can't explain, a little bit spicy. Um, so um, it can be dried for tea and for potpourri. Um, nice kind of fall one. Um, let's go to my next here. So this is Joe Pye weed. I think most of us would recognize the weed. Um, so no longer called Eupatorium. Um, it is now eutrochium, and um, there's a few plants that have been getting changed, and it's driving me nuts. Um, but, um, you know, it's a, an important uh, source um, of food for wildlife, attracts a lot of different pollinators. Um, um, it also attracts birds. Um, you can see hummingbirds. I mean, it's, it's just a, a great, great pollinator plant. Um, so, and in the fall, um, many of the birds like goldfinch would love seeds. They're very attracted to it. Um, and then um, the um, story about how it came to be called Joe Pye weed. It's a legend, nobody knows if it's true. Um, but as the story goes, there was once an Indian medicine man named Joe Pye who used a concoction from a wild plant found growing in the nearby woods to cure typhoid fever. His brew is said to have halted an epidemic that raged in colonial Massachusetts. Hence, this local plant became forever known as Joe Pye weed. So I just, I like that little story. Could be true. Uh, wintergreen, also a plant I've known since, you know, I was little in the woods. So I like to take the leaf. Um, my brother used to call it checkerberry. Um, he liked calling it checkerberry because that is another name for it. Tea berry, box berry, um, part shade to full sun, definitely acidic. Um, great ground cover. If you're doing a lot of native shrubs, um, if you're doing like a native roadie or, you know, woodland, woodland types of um, native shrubs, it's a great ground cover underneath it. Um, you know, you don't have to use myrtle or ivy or pachysandra. Um, so, um, it was named for Jean-Francois Gaultier, a naturalist and physician in Quebec in the mid 18th century. The species name procumbens, and this goes for a lot of plants with that second, um, description, um, is apparently derived from the Latin word procumbo, which means to fall prostrate, a reference to its prostrate habit. So procrumbens and prostrata basically means the same thing. Handsome plant and the, gets the white flowers. Whoops. Bluettes. I hope you've seen these. Um, I've seen them all my life. Um, it, not as many as I used to. But um, these are sweet little plants, also called Quaker ladies. It says the petite little mounds of sky blue flowers are so named because their shape is similar. similar to the hats once worn regularly by women of the Quaker faith. Um, other info says they're called Quaker Lady Bluettes because the pale color of the flower is similar to the shades of fabric used in making dresses worn by the Quaker ladies. It's a spring bloomer, very, very pretty, soft, soft blue little plant. Good pollinator. Um, here's the um, beach pea. Um, which I, again, I've known for ages. I don't see as much of it as I used to. Um, and that Japonicus confused me. So I was looking it up and apparently it's native to here 
but it's also native to other parts of the world, including Japan. Okay, but doesn't mean it came over from Japan. Um, so um, uh, it's pollinated by bees. It'll take that, you can see it's growing on a sharp, straight beach sand. Um, so it's definitely a coastal, a coastal plant. Um, and it's pollinated by all kinds of moths and butterflies and bees. Take sandy soil, salt, you name it. It's not fragrant and it's not edible, by the way. Um, um, you've got to be careful just because it says P. It's related, but it may not be edible. Um, so this is one of my favorites, cardinal flower. I know of an enormous stand in situate that I that I keep secret. Um, but you can grow it too. Um, prefers moist soil, sun to part shade. It'll grow in a regular garden situation, but it doesn't want to be dry. Um, uh, it's late blooming in August, you know, in there, that um, period of time. And it can be only, only pollinated by hummingbirds or other insects with very long proboscises. I hope I said that word right. Um, they have to have long, you know. So, um, so that makes it kind of special too. Um, so the one on the left is a nice big stand and you can see it's near the water. Um, I knew a lady down in uh, Westport, Mass, that had a beautiful small pond on her property, and the entire thing was ringed with Lobelia cardinalis. There is a blue one that's also um, native, the syphilitica, but I find that um, kind of takes over a little bit. Whoops. Okay, trumpet honeysuckle, Lysera sempervirens. Um, saw this plant years ago in the Men of Kent Cemetery on... Um, Meeting House Lane in Situate. Um, and um, <clears throat> it does, it's, it is listed as a native. Um, it's a fabulous hummingbird plant. Very pretty. It's red, but it's like a soft red. And the foliage is a little bit glaucous. It's got a little blue gray to it. Very pretty. I thought I'd try to work one um, vine in here for everybody. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, look at the croziers on this guy. Um, this is ostrich fern. And the, these croziers, these fiddleheads here, are edible. That's not true of all ferns. So don't, you know, only, as far as I know, this is the only one I know. So when you go to buy fiddleheads, this is the plant they're coming from. This is it when it's unfurled. Um, nice. Nice to work ferns in, and I, and I particularly love this one. Um, it does go by runners. I wouldn't call it invasive, um, but it does run, um, not right next to each other. It will kind of take a little you know, few feet and then pop up. Easy to take out if you need to, um, but it lends a really nice quality and a bit of height um, to the um, to your um, garden. Um, the ancient word um, is a Greek ancient word for ostrich and fern. That's what, what it comes from. Um, it's also called shuttlecock fern. Um, and the shuttlecock is the badminton birdie because if you kind of look at it, it kind of looks like that. So those are a couple of other names for it. Um, go to Bayberry. Okay, Mirica Pennsylvanica, Bayberry. Uh, hopefully we all know this plant pretty well. Um, I've seen it growing on the side of the road. Um, not, again, as in, in as much abundance as I would like to see. Um, so I did want to get a few shrubs in here. Um, this is definitely native to our area. This, this picture here is the flower. You know, it's not a, that exciting. Here's when it's a full grown shrub. And here's when the um, berries are formed. Um, very pretty um, and um, incredibly aromatic. It smells very similar to the sweet fern, but a bit different. Um, and the waxy berries have been used for centuries to extract, extract candle wax. And the wax has a beautiful natural olive green tone, which I think is kind of cool. Um, this, uh, I know is native. This is the swamp azalea. 
or geez, sorry about that, rhododendron viscosum. Um, it is incredibly fragrant, beautiful, beautiful fragrance. Um, all of the viscosums, as far as I know, have it, but this is definitely native to our area. Um, it likes it moist, sun depart shade, um, acidy, humusy, um, not straight, not right in the water. It needs some, needs moist, but well-drained. Um, and um, it, it can take a little flooding, but not continuous. Um, it prefers sun and um, dappled shade or high open part shade. Um, we came across it down at the Man House Wildflower Garden. It was there, we did not plant it. And that was a pretty exciting moment. So just beautiful, beautiful plant. Got a wettish area in your yard. Um, it's a nice one. Um, this is a plant also that grew down at the Man House on its own. Um, this is Syrincium angustifolium, um, narrow leaf blue eyed grass. And um, picture's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is very blue. And there are cultivars out there. There's one called Lucerne. And it's not the same. So that's a, like a cultivar of a native plant. This is the real thing. And I actually found this growing out um, behind Kennedy's um, a couple of summers ago. I was very excited. I stole a piece. Um, anyway, um, yeah, very, very cute. And this was something we did find also growing, growing by itself down at the man house. Um, it does like it a little bit moist. Um, found in meadows, low woods, along shorelines. It's a good early season pollinator. And the helictine bees are the most likely pollinators. They have short tongues so they can get in there. So a lot of times bees, it's all about, you know, how long their tongue is to get, get into these, um, these plants. It's pretty specific sometimes. So very pretty little plant. Um, seaside goldenrod. There's a tons of goldenrods, okay, solidagos that are native. Um, I included this one because I wanted to um, um, have another plant that was seaside because, yeah, you know, we're in situate. So um, great plant. Um, good for a health strip, sandy, salty areas. Um, it's a um, good resource for overwintering gall producing insects. Um, uh, predatory wasps that are beneficial, um, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, you know, the birds like it. Everything likes it. It's a great, all the solidagos are great pollinator plants. Um, I like to see um, this plant, which is our next one here, um, the aster with some of the late golden rods. Really pretty combination. Really pretty. Um, I, I really like this plant a lot. This is, again, asters now called Symphiotrichons, uh, Nova Anglia. Um, and um, I'm just trying to find my, here we are. Okay, sorry. Um, so this plant, the, the aster, fabulous, um, um, tough, tough plant. Um, uh, it, it will, um, there, you know, there are varieties you can buy, um, cultivars, nativars, but I would stick with the true, there's many, many more um, asters um, that are native. So that's what you want to go for and not the, not the named ones. Um, I have seen this, I can remember seeing some down, it's not Finney's anymore, O'Brien's and the um, fire station. I remember seeing some down there, um, kind of thing that before the train came back, there's a lot of cool um, native plants that grew along the tracks. So this is a great one. And it's good for late in the season. Very pretty plant. Um, Blue vervain. Um, I used to see this driving up to Maine along the highway. Um, and my friend of mine had a um, like a marsh behind her house in Coasset to grow there. I saw it growing behind Kennedy's um, the last couple of years. Um, I never noticed it before. Um, it's also called Simpler's Joy. And a simpler is one 
grows or gathers simples, which are medicinal herbs. Uh, it's um, furs moist soil. Um, bubble bees are among the important pollinators for it. Um, in ancient times, the plant was thought to be a cure-all among med medicinal plants. And the genus Latin name in Latin is, um, means sacred plant. So vervain means sacred plant. It does attract a lot of pollinators. Um, it's a special value to native bees, which is always something to consider. So um, you have this on your handout. These are resources. Um, and um, so you've already got all those. Um, I, I will have some plants at Kennedy's. There are other places to buy them. Blue Stem is just starting out, but there's somebody to stay, stay in touch with. Um, my friend out in, um, she lives up in New Hampshire now. Um, she's got some great, unusual native plants. Um, Prairie Moons, Grace. And I do um, consults in garden design. So if you need me to come help you identify plants in your yard um, or do anything, or I can design you a, a, a native garden. Um, so um, the contact is on the um, uh, title page. I'm not sure it's, you're seeing that anymore, but um, you can always find me at Kennedy's. Um, so that is that. Um, I also have some, some links Oops, I don't know what happened. I guess it ended. Okay, no. Nope. Okay, some links for books and other, um, uh, or um, some other links that you might be interested in looking at. Um, the Wild Ones is another great organization I've joined. Um, some very, very cool plant people, um, native plant people, uh, local people are on that. Um, I really enjoyed Dr. Tallamy's talk the other night. I do have his book. And uh, this garden revolution with Larry Weiner is um, and Tom Christopher is also a good one. So I thank you so much for for coming tonight, and I hope you will do something about this. That you can do it. It's something you can do, and that we can move forward in trying to um, get our town to be a little more proactive um, and care about this more. So that's something I'm going to be working on and trying to um, let people know how that's going. So thank you again. Um, okay. Have a lovely night. Bye-bye. We've, we've got some questions for you. Sure. Okay. Um, and some comments. So I'll just go through them. One okay. person commented that garlic mustard makes good pesto. Yes, I've heard that. What, what, I, what I get nervous about is if people start thinking these plants are good. <laughs> you know, that, that they won't get rid of them. You know, yeah. um, I, I'm sure it's good, but nothing beats basil pesto. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe before you, you know, um, destroy it, you might wanna, you know, make something with it. <laughs> okay, next question is, Ajuga, my candidate for an invasive, took over a portion of the lawn. Any tips for controlling or eliminating it? As a matter of fact, I have this patch in the middle of my, it's a perfect circle of it. And I just wrote down today that we've got to deal with it. I don't even have a lot of lawn, okay? Um, so I, all you can, you know, it goes by runner. Anything that grows goes by runners, you know, underground stoloniferous roots is very hard to control when it gets wound up with other plants. So I don't know how big an area you're talking, but you know, either you're gonna to have to probably live with it or you're going to have to redo your whole lawn. Um, you know, I'm not even sure how, you know, I mean, I am just so against any kind of, you know, herbicides and weed control stuff. Um, you know, there, there is something, was it corn gluten? I have no idea. You might wanna look into that. Um, and I know some people have great success with that, but I don't know what, what kinds of plants it deals with. You know, I know it does, you know, crabgrass or something. So okay. anyway, yeah. Um, a few years back, I purchased an assortment of trilliums. 
To date, only one returns on a regular basis. Any tips for better success in the future? Um, well, <clears throat> I, I bought, brought in a bunch of trilliums to Kennedy's one year um, that I bought wholesale. You know, they came literally like in like, like the guy took them in the shovel and put them in a thing and gave them to me. And I had to take them all and pot them up. So um, I bought some and I don't think any of them came up. I, I don't know if they are just difficult and that's one reason they are so expensive. I have had, I have a few in my yard um, and I, I think they need to be um, my, my sense is they need to be um, strong and mature before they'll transplant well or something. Um, you know, I've got um, the, the little yellow, uh, I forget what they're called. They're spotted leaves with yellow, yellow trillium. Um, and those do really well for me. Um, those have increased in the past few years. I have one or two other ones that I've gotten um, uh, from you know people in the um, rock garden society. I wish I could tell you. Um, um, I'm not sure where you got them. That might be something to go back to these people and say, "Hey, what's up?" So um, I know they're not easy to propagate, and they grow very slowly. That's all I can tell you. Okay. Not much help. Uh, another question is. Near me, honeybees love many of these invasive plants for late season pollen and nectar, especially not weed and loose strife. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, they have to get used to different food. I mean, just like my cats, I had to get used to different food. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, you know, be that as it may, you know what I mean? It's still a matter of, you know, those are invasive plants and we don't, we don't want them. And there are plenty of other um, uh, great plants that um, are good pollinators that aren't, aren't invasive. Um, in fact, you know, I could have sworn I heard something recently about, you know, sometimes the honeybees um, can be a threat to some of the native bees, um, which I hate to think about. Um, but um, you know, so, I mean, I guess hands down, I just have to say, you know, you still have to get rid of the um, invasive stuff. Okay. Can you recommend some native low growing ground covers for a slope? Um, yeah. Um, is it sunny or shady? Well, let me go do both because obviously the person's out there. Shady would be things like um, bearberry um, chrysogenum, um, uh, native uh, ginger, uh, to name a few. Um, what's the other one there? The sweet um, woodruff. Um, you know, there's there's lots of shady ones. The um, uh, Gaultheria um, that we we showed. Um, for sun, it's a. I think it's a little bit harder. Um, um, there are actually some nice um, native grasses that could work, you know, the blue stems and stuff. And then there's one called that is native that will take some Waldsteinia frigaria frigaria. Um, um, not sure how you say that word, um, but that will take um, sun. Uh, I can't think of too many um, good ones for sun um, that are really ground covers. I'm just kind of drawing a blank. Um, uh, certainly if that person wants to contact me, um, I can help them more. If there's things I may need to um, brush up on or, you know, so I'm always willing to talk to them later, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, your review of native plants were all perennials. Is there such a thing as a native annual, or do you have any suggestions for spring, summer annuals? That are native? Um, you know, I just come into my mind. I mean, if they grow here, they're going to be perennial, 
you know what I mean, is for the most part, I think. Um, oh, you totally caught me off guard. I mean, there's lots of annuals that you can grow, but that aren't native. Um, nothing really comes to mind. Um, sorry, something to maybe look up, um, you know, native New England annuals. I, I just, oh, um, I'm sorry. You know what's an annual? Uh, jewelweed. Jewelweed's an annual, come to think of it, um, which is a great um, plant for, um, I'm sure everybody knows it. Um, it's kind of a watery stalk, um, kind of light green watery stalk, and has little orange flowers. Um, it's also called touch me not. Um, it's um, purportedly a remedy for poison ivy, but Russ Cohen, he dispelled that um, at a recent meeting I attended with him. So um, yeah, so that is a manual okay. and uh, it's a good plant, good pollinator. Will all these native plants be available to purchase at Kennedy's this year? Not all of them. Um, not all of them. Um, that's why I, I certainly wanted to include lots of other, um, uh, you know, resources for that. Um, I'll have quite a few, quite a few. So um, do come in. And I didn't cover every single native plant, you know. Um, I just covered... I, I had to, um, you know, winnow it down a bit because it could go on for a long time. Um, but these were in particular plants that I've seen, you know, that I've, I've actually had, you know, um, experience with and have seen growing here with the exception of the New Jersey tea. So. Okay. The next question is, what can I plant that is native, has color, either flowers or shrubs, and is both bunny and deer resistant? Oh, geez. <laughs> well, you know, as a rule, native plants are not that attractive to wildlife, I believe, as a rule. Um, they want tulips and, and hosta, apparently. Um, but um, I will also say that if the plant is fragrant, I, I'm not sure I remember all the criteria. There was a lot of criteria there. Um, um, so bayberry or sweet fern, you know, are not going to be eaten by them. Um, uh, I know one plant that is eaten, and it's not actually native to our area, but a lot of people, it is a native plant, and that is echinacea. Echinacea, um, you know, the, um, what's the other name for echinacea? What's the other name for it? Coneflower. Coneflower, thank you. Um, that, um, they, they love it. Used to, they used to come down and eat it down at the wildflower garden. And, you know, but it's not native to our area. It's native to the United States, but I really focused on what's native to here. So there may be many more choices um, for you um, other than what I've talked about because these are really specific to our you know, Citric, Cohasset, Hingham, Norwell, the South Shore. Um, so were there other criteria besides the deer thing? What else? Uh, that's all it said. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, look up, if you want native, look up native shrubs and then, you know, to the U.S. and then you might find, you might find more things. Um, I didn't specifically, um, uh, prepare this with that in mind. So, I mean, I know a bit about certain plants that are, that are um, uh, deer resistant, but I'm not a pro on it, so. Okay. The next question is, I found a trumpet vine growing in my yard. What are your thoughts? Should I pull it up, quarantine it? Well, you know, it's supposed to be native, right? It's a native, um, but it's, um, I find it, you know, just because a plant is native doesn't mean it's not aggressive. Um, look at um, uh, milkweed, you know, um, uh, Asclepius syriacus, you know, the, the, the milkweed that we see a lot of. Um, that can really be aggressive. Um, so such is not the case that everything is not 
um, a little bit rambunctious. Um, it's up to you. I don't, I don't like orange, so I wouldn't have it in my yard. Um, but um, you know, that's that's entirely up to you. You can keep an eye on it if you want to keep it and just, you know, keep an eye on it. So it is native. It's not like um, some of these other plants that I talked about that we really got to deal with. So, okay. The yeah. next question is: Can some natives be grown from seed? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Um, you know, you have sometimes it's special instructions. Like I know when you're growing. Um, I happen to know that when you're growing um, Aquilegia or Columbine of any kind, they need to go through a cold period. You know, so they they need to be stratified. It's called stratification. Um, so. Um, you know, sometimes I remember down when I worked at the wildflower garden, we used to do some things from seed, but we do it right in the garden. Like we, we do it in a pot and we'd sink the pot into the ground. And so, you know, it was protected. It was like it was in the ground, but we could kind of keep an eye on where, where it was. So that's something to consider and decide what, what you want to grow. I mean, of course, you know, everything as seeds and pretty much most I would think native plants can be grown from seed there are other you know cultivated plants that can only be done from you know um, tissue culture and and um, you know cuttings so okay the next question is is clethra a native plant or shrub do you recommend it yes um, I, I have thought about um, including it it's actually um, a favorite of mine, um, and I kind of wish I had put it in there. It's um, as a kid, or even still as an adult, driving like going to JJ's ice cream on 3A in Cohasset in the summer in August, and all you could smell was clethra all the way down 3A that in that part of 3A. Um, and I remember it was in the woods down at the um, uh, wildflower garden beyond the actual garden area. You could it was out beyond it into the woods. Um, does kind of like it moist. Um, great pollinator plant and just heavenly, heavenly fragrance. Yeah, great plant. The next question, um, well, there's a comment too. Wild Seed Project based in Maine uh, has native seeds. Uh, the next question is, are there other varieties of native milkweed? Mine has white blossoms. Yes, um, there's actually a few. There's like one that's got green flower. Um, there's um, there's the um, swamp milkweeds. Um, you know the Asclepius um, incarnatas. They're called. Call them incarnata because the the one is um, pinkish. It's supposed to look like fleshy pink incarnata. Um, so those are, there's quite a few actually, um, Salivantii, um, and I may have a few more in, in at Kennedy's, I just can't remember, I have so many plants coming in, but um, there absolutely are, so. Okay, the next question is, last year I planted a few New England asters, but every stem got chewed up by something. Is there anything I could do about that? Oh, you know what? Yeah. Um, is it an ant, like a little animal or a bug? We don't know. We can't it ask. It doesn't right? say, but I'm yeah. assuming my the rabbits eat mine. <laughs> yeah, actually, come to think of it, so so there you go. There's the answer to that other question. Um, yes, they do eat. They do eat natives. Um, you know, I use I use plant skid um, to deter rabbits because I've got um, a little resident guy here that you know I'm very um, attached to at this point because he was just a little thing when I met him and he still comes back and um, and you know he just he wants to eat my tulips right now so I immediately the minute I saw my tulips coming up I went out with the plant skin I use the um, granular form so I'm not constantly spraying and it lasts for quite a while and it seems to work it lasts for you know a month and a half or so um, not cheap, but uh, you know, there's 
there's not like rabbit proof plants. I mean, I, I, I came across a list of some that they supposedly, but you know, you can't live like that, you know, so. Okay, the next question is, how do you determine if a plant such as a columbine is a native or not? Well, there's really, as far as I know, there's only one native around here, okay? And that is the canadensis, the Aquilegia canadensis. Um, you know, there are ones that are native to other parts of the country. You know, there's like a blue one or something that grows out in Colorado. Um, but around here, it's just that one. So, I mean, you, it's not as easy to tell when they're not in bloom, but um, certainly when they bloom, um, you would know they get the red with a little bit of yellow um, inside. The next question is, what is the anti-rabbit treatment you just mentioned? How do you spell it? P-L-A-N-T, like plant. Then it's S-K-Y-D-D. -D. It's uh, Swedish, but you can get it here. I mean, Kennedy's carries it. Okay. So I get the, the largest size I can. <laughs> it's not cheap. Yeah. All right. Um, the next question is, what invasive plants can we blame on the pilgrims during their years of settling the New World? Jeez. Oh, wow. Well, thing I don't know about the pilgrims, but the colonists, as I said, things like Queen Anne's Lace, which can be a little overzealous. I remember I used to take care of a traffic island in town. Um, many years ago i did it for about eight years and um one day you know it's just queen is like, oh it's so pretty you know and and i left it and it went to seed and the next year i was picking queen Anne lace queen Anne's lace babies out of there with practically tweezers it was everywhere um so that um tansy um was the one i was thinking of earlier and again, I can't strictly say that the pilgrims brought them, but early colonists did. Um, uh, you know, tansy, um, um, which grows on the side of the road, chicory, um, I, something else I said earlier. Oh, the great mullen, you know, with the big silvery leaves and the big tall yellow flower. Um, so those are some I know the colonists did bring here. So. Okay. I think that's all of our questions. And if you want the link to all of the resources that Susan mentioned, it's at the very top of the chat. I put a link in there. It's on our website under Garden and Green Expo. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And I want to thank Susan for a great presentation. Well, thank you. I really had fun with it. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Hope okay. to see you at the next one. All right. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night.